1985 Chicago Bears are widely considered to be among the best football teams of all time. Some went on to become successful head coaches, while one went on to face charges of second-degree murder. Jim McMahon was the fifth overall pick in the 1982 NFL Draft, but it wasn't immediately apparent that he was destined for Super Bowl glory. His first season, shortened by a player's strike, resulted in a 3-6 win-loss record, and his second was a so-so 8-8. Eight eight. But the Bears improved to 10-6 in 1984 as a warm-up act for that almost undefeated 1985 season. Even as McMahon was becoming just as well known for his antics off the field as for his exploits on it, he was known to party like a rock star, always wearing sunglasses and living it up at Chicago hotspots. McMahon never again reached the heights of the Bears' 85 campaign, perpetually hampered by injuries. Over the course of his football career, McMahon suffered a lacerated kidney, a broken neck, and numerous concussions, at one point considering suicide as a way to alleviate the constant physical pain. He told the Chicago Tribune that he still suffers from serious headaches, memory loss, depression, vision problems, and was diagnosed with dementia. I've got these puzzles and uh, it helps me to just try to remember things, you know, colors and where things go. Chiropractic treatments have helped with his neck issues, as has medical marijuana, which he said helped end his dependence on prescription painkillers, of which he was taking as many as 100 a month. In addition to adding his name to a class-action lawsuit against the NFL alleging negligence when it came to concussions, he also signed up to be part of Renegades, a Las Vegas show in which he and fellow athletes Jose Canseco and Terrell Owens discussed their rowdy years. Among the 1985 Chicago Bears' more formidable and consistent weapons was Willie Galt, a wide receiver with rockets for feet who also doubled as the Bears' kick returner. During the 85 season, he even returned a kick 99 yards for a touchdown, showing off the skills he picked up as a world-class sprinter and hurdler in college. Perhaps his most valuable contribution was keeping every opponent's best defender winded and frustrated for the entire game. He simply tried to be the fastest guy on the field at all times. After his NFL career, Galt returned to his first love of track and field. According to Fox Sports, he broke the world records in both the 100- and 200-meter dash for the 45- to 49-year-old age group, then waited a few years and broke the same records in the 50- to 54-year-old age group. Then, upon turning 55, he went ahead and broke those records again in the 55- to 59-year-old age group. Even though he's now over 60, he could probably outrun half the NFL's defensive backs. Richard Dent's very surname announced what the defensive end could very well do to the opposing team's quarterback's skull each play. In their Super Bowl victory, the 85 Bears defense slapped the Patriots all over the field, but it was Dent who was named the game's MVP after recording 1.5 sacks and two forced fumbles. These days, he's bringing his tenacity to fight for a worthy cause — health insurance for football greats. In 2018, according to the Chicago Sun-Times, Dent was among a group of 22 retired players enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame who threatened to break off their relationship with the institution if they didn't receive an annual pension and help paying for the medical care they needed after playing a physically taxing sport. Two things available to every Major League Baseball veteran, regardless of Hall of Fame status. He was also part of a $1 billion lawsuit against the NFL along with Jim McMahon which claims that players were not properly informed about the long-term risks of brain trauma. The anchor of the 85 Bears' fabled linebacking corps and the undisputed leader of the defense, middle linebacker Mike Singletary earned Defensive Player of the Year honors during that magical season by both being the smartest man on the field and crushing anyone in his path. It's only fitting that the 10-time Pro Bowl selection would go on to a second career as a coach. Singletary was named head coach of the San Francisco 49ers in 2008 and in three seasons compiled an underwhelming 18-22 record. He went on to similarly middling stints as linebackers coach for the Vikings and Rams before being named head coach of Trinity Christian Addison, a high school, in 2018. Later in 2018, CBS Sports announced that Singletary would coach the Memphis Express, a franchise in the eight-team Alliance of American Football, an upstart would-be NFL competitor. Singletary joined former NFL notables Brad Childress, Steve Spurrier, and Michael Vick among the coaching ranks of the AAF. Unfortunately, the alliance suspended play and business operations in April 2019 during its first and only season. Of all the popular players on the 85 Bears, none were bigger than rookie defensive lineman William the Refrigerator Perry, a charismatic defensive tackle and defensive end who earned his nickname for his size. 
listed at an appliance like 6 foot 2 inches and 335 pounds. However, Perry saw some playing time as a running back because it would be foolhardy for opposing teams to even try and stop him. Indeed, the Fridge scored one of the Bears' many touchdowns in its route of the New England Patriots in Super Bowl XX. In contrast to his imposing stature, Perry had a goofy, amiable, almost sweet personality that endeared the rookie instantly to his teammates and Bears fans. After the end of his playing days in 1994, Perry has struggled with health and personal problems. In 2011, Perry publicly revealed that he is an alcoholic. Have you admitted it? Yeah, you admit, admit myself, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, and then just keep on going. A stay in rehab, orders by doctors, and familial intervention didn't lead him to stop drinking. And by 2016, he'd lost most of his hearing, had difficulty walking without the aid of a walker, and his weight had grown to as high as 450 pounds. Perry's family believes he's exhibited symptoms of CTE, the traumatic brain condition caused by repeated concussions from which numerous former NFL players have suffered. He reportedly resides in an assisted living facility in Aiken, South Carolina. Linebacker Wilbur Marshall was better known as the guy the opposition had to worry about in the unlikely event that they managed to avoid getting flattened by Mike Singletary. Marshall was just as strong in coverage as he was getting to the quarterback, and he would even sometimes sub for Singletary at the middle linebacker position on third downs. He was one of the more versatile players on the 85 Bears' storied defense, but his retirement has been marred by an adversarial relationship with the NFL. The Bears reportedly reneged on a guaranteed contract that should have paid Marshall a yearly salary for 19 years, but they cut him off after 11, forcing him to pay his own substantial medical bills for football-related health issues, including knee and shoulder replacements, spine and neck issues, and carpal tunnel syndrome. Additionally, the former linebacker has been frustrated by his lack of consideration for enshrinement in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He's never been on a nominating ballot, despite a resume that could very well merit induction. In addition to his Super Bowl ring with the Bears, he won another title with Washington in 1991, and he was a Pro Bowl selection three times. Speaking with the Talk of Fame Network in 2016, he confessed, It's really hard when you see some of the guys who were in there. I just don't get it. A backup linebacker, Ron Rivera started 56 of 137 games over a nine-year career, all with the Chicago Bears, but he still racked up some impressive stats. He was almost as well known for his involvement in the community as he was for his play on the field, taking home the Bears' 1988 Man of the Year award. And when his playing days were done, he underwent one of the more successful player-to-coach transitions in league history. After a few years in the broadcasting booth, Rivera served on the coaching staffs of the Chicago Bears and Philadelphia Eagles, and then the Chicago Bears again, before finally getting a promotion to head coach, named the leader of the Carolina Panthers in 2011. Under Rivera's leadership, the Panthers went from a woeful 2-14 the season prior to his arrival to perennial contenders, capturing three consecutive NFC South titles, guiding his team to the 2016 Super Bowl, and winning the AP's NFL Coach of the Year award twice in three years. In 2019, a new Panthers owner fired Rivera, but by 2020, he'd landed a new gig as coach of the Washington Commanders. For cornerback Leslie Frazier, 1985 was a bit of a double-edged sword. He led the team with six interceptions, watched his defense dominate nearly everybody they faced, and helped shut down the Patriots receivers in their Super Bowl route. However, in the second quarter of that game, he suffered a knee injury during a punt return that ended his playing career. After helping out with the programs at Trinity International University and the University of Illinois, Frazier returned to the NFL in 1999 as the defensive backs coach for the Philadelphia Eagles. Definitely not a yelling a screamer, uh, but more of a teacher, you know, a guy who uh, spends the time in the classroom teaching the things that need to be taught. He's been a mainstay on the sidelines of various clubs ever since. Frazier was hired as the defensive coordinator for the Cincinnati Bengals, a defensive assistant for the Indianapolis Colts, and in 2010, the interim and then full-fledged head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. After posting a 21-32-1 record in four seasons, the Vikings terminated Frazier in 2013. Frazier joined the Buffalo Bills as defensive coordinator in 2017, and the team made the playoffs for the first time in 18 years. They then opened the next season with massive back-to-back -back losses, which resulted in head coach Sean McDermott stripping Frazier of his play-calling duties. But Frazier kept his job, and after that disappointing 2018 season, the Bills reached the postseason in each of the next two years. Place kicker Kevin Butthead Butler, seriously, that was his college nickname, 
enjoyed a stellar career as a Georgia Bulldog before joining the Bears as a rookie in 1985. He would eventually become the Bears' all-time leading scorer in his 11 seasons with the team, before having his ridiculous total of 1,116 points eclipsed by Robbie Gould in 2015. After his retirement in 1997, following a handful of games with the Arizona Cardinals, Butler went back to his home state of Georgia. According to the Chicago Tribune, Kevin Butler returned to his alma mater in 2017, re-enrolling to complete his degree and serve as an advisor to the football program. He's also the father of former NFL punter Drew Butler. Life and speedy cornerback Mike Richardson called himself L.A. Mike and declared, I like to steal it and make him pay. He could back up those boasts. During the Bears' remarkable 15-1 record in 1985, Richardson intercepted the ball four times and returned it for an eye-popping 174 total yards. Drafted high in the second round by the Bears after an illustrious All-American career at Arizona State, Richardson retired after a three-game run with the San Francisco 49ers in 1989 that yielded him another Super Bowl championship. After his career on the field ended, Richardson struggled with addiction and legal issues. According to the Chicago Tribune, he'd been arrested on drug charges 21 times since he left football, including a 2008 case involving crack cocaine and methamphetamine possession. Richardson was convicted of a drug possession charge in 2019, and in December 2020, police in Phoenix arrested Richardson on suspicion of murder, believing he shot and killed a man over a drug-related dispute. Iron Mike Ditka is one of just two men in NFL history to win championships as a player, assistant coach, and head coach, and his legacy was cemented with that legendary 1985 Chicago Bears season. Now over 80 years old, Ditka has long since retired from coaching. After the subpar 1992 season, by which time he'd become the second winningest coach in Bears history, the team dismissed him. He returned to the NFL later in the decade, but was fired by the New Orleans Saints in 2000 after a three-year, 15-33 stint. Ditka easily slid into broadcasting, serving as an analyst on NFL presentations by NBC and ESPN. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite sports stars are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.